Jesus said these words. He said, I've come that they may have life and life to the full. And when, when he said those life-changing words, he said them in the context of also saying, I am the good shepherd. It's all around that time. And we need to understand that when Jesus speaks about, I come to give life, he really means it. And he is totally good. He's the good shepherd. He wants to lead us in his ways of life that are the best. We must understand that. As well as that, Jesus at the same time said, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we get there a contrast between the life that Jesus has come to give and actually a life that is ultimately destructive, that steals, that takes away, which actually our enemy, the enemy of the souls, the devil, wants to do. It's what he's always wanted to do. It's what happened in, in the Garden of Eden. It's what happened with the first Adam and Eve. They stepped into the goodness. They were created into the goodness of God, but the enemy was listened to. And he began his work of stealing, killing, and destroying. And that is the world that we're now born into. That's the world we live in. We live in a broken world. We live in where there's much evidence of things being stolen and destroyed. But Jesus still says, I've come to give life and life to the full. That's good news. Yeah. Okay? And that's the basis of this new series that actually we're launching today called Real Life. It's Real Life Hashtag. And what we want to do is look at some real issues in life throughout the year. It's not going to be every week. We're going to interspace with other things. But it's going to be real life hashtag work. What does Jesus and what does God say about work? Real life hashtag um, depression. Real life hashtag death. And, yep, yeah, you've got it. Real life hashtag sex. Okay. And guess which one we're going to start with? <laughs> which was not my choice, by the way. It was in the hands of those who planned such things. That we should start with sex. So this morning is real life, hashtag sex. What does the Bible say about sex? What, do we, what actually, for all of us, all of us in this room, and we've, we've said to the teens, we want you to stay in, for all of us, what does the Bible have to say about us, about this for us? And it's a, a subject which, to be honest, we've got to face, we've got to treat with care, treat with respect, treat with dignity, but also treat with courage as well. And we've got to speak clearly on, because the world is drowning out what God is saying. And we need the church to speak clearly in the midst of that. Basically, it's a minefield. It's a minefield of personal experience. And the reality is this, that we are a very mixed group. That in this room right now, we've got teens, We've got singles, we've got marrieds, but we've also got those whose marriages have broken up. We've also got those whose loved ones are no longer with them. We've got that mix of just life experience. We've also got, actually, if you mention the word sex, as I will be doing a few times this morning, so be kind of get that, you know, let, let's be prepared for that. If you mention the word sex, it can trigger all sorts of emotions. It can trigger regret. It can trigger hurt. It can trigger 
failure. It can trigger, if only I could turn the clock back. For others, it can trigger actually some real agonies of abuse. But for others, they know the blessing of sex and the enjoyment of sex within marriage. And already there will be a reaction going on in the room according to your personal experience. And we've got to recognize that. I asked a, a good friend, and I was with Cheryl at the time, a good friend and a, a, a single lady, and I said, as a single lady, and a, a, a mature, a, a, an adult single lady, what, what would help you to hear <laughs> coming to a Sunday morning when we're talking about sex? A godly single lady. And, and almost without a moment of thought, her, her quick response was this. He said, the mere fact you're asking that question is helpful. She said, often, you know, sex gets spoken about with marriage. Or sex gets spoken to. It's the, it's the talk for teens, isn't it? The relationship talk. You know? But we don't often talk about it as family, as church, together. And if you add on to that all our own personal experience, whatever, you just need to add on the reality of sexual temptation. This would be no hands up this morning, OK? OK, so you're safe. I'm just going to get that out there. Okay? So any questions I ask are now rhetorical, OK? But who here has not struggled with sexual temptation? No, hands up. Okay. It's a real issue. And we open the page of our Bible, and we find that possibly the greatest king that ever lived, David, he fell, his downfall was sex. And then we look at possibly the wisest king that ever lived, Solomon. What was his downfall? Sex. And then we look at the strongest man that ever looked, lived, Samson. What was his downfall? Sex. <laughs> well, what chance do we have? Strongest, wisest, greatest. And the Bible addresses it as a real issue. And there are numerous scriptures you could go to, but kind of this isn't the talk for this, as it were, in terms of just handling sexual temptation. It's huge. And it confronts every one of us in different ways at different times. Just this week, I, I've, got an Insta, uh, I've got an Instagram account on my phone. And I'm very careful who I follow. I, you know, it's family. You know, it's, it, it, of course, Spurs. OK? I don't mention Spurs this morning. Um, it, it, it's sailing, OK? And I've got a few National Geographic, and it's all, all safe. It's good. It's wholesome. It's, you know, there, whatever, you know. And I just went on it. I don't often go on it, but I went on this week, and there on the sailing app was a beautiful boat, but draped over it was this, you know, very, very kind of lightly, you know, well, you can, yeah, lady, OK? On the boat. And suddenly the image is there. And the image arouses. And suddenly you've got a moment. What do I do? We're bombarded by it. Temptation to sexual, sexual immorality is great. And if it's, if it's, not, it's not only a minefield in our personal experience, it's a minefield in society. I was born in the 1950s. <laughs> Always good to pause and wait for reaction. Surely not would be a helpful reaction. <laughs> Thank you. I was born in the 1950s. <laughs> Lacking conviction. And which meant I, my teenage years were spent in the 1960s. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So thank you, Brian. So I had long hair. You're reading my notes. So I had long hair. I and I can remember distinctly one evening going to a rock uh, a rock concert, and yeah, and long hair, long flying hair, and had these long tr long trench coats were in then. Okay, they were long trench coats. Kind of had that. And, you know, totally buzzed out by the music, you know, kind of, you know, my head, my mouth was slightly open, my head was still banging, like that, you know. And going home, I remember going home to mum and dad, okay, and they're sitting at home having the cup of cocoa, and it's me, <laughs> you know, and spots as well. And, 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 and basically, what I blurted out was, the revolution's begun. It's this profound statement on life uh, that summed up the whole evening. Uh, but the revolution's begun. But actually, something happened in the 60s. There was a, a sexual revolution, and there were all sorts of things that came into play, whether it was you know, birth control, whether it was pop culture, whether it's philosophies of the time, all sorts of thinking, worldly thinking, bombarded Western society. So suddenly, the banner became free love. Tragic, tragically, we're living with massive consequences of that in our day. And our children have, been, have grown up into a society where the very foundations of godliness... It's not that we had a godly society before then. There's always been issues of sex and sexual temptation. But something was given permission. It was the permissive society. That was to affect society and everything. It is a minefield. You know, someone, a good friend, his name is Paul Mogford, said this to me this week, and it just helped me very much to sum up all of that. He said, outside of Christ, all forms of sex and sexuality are part of the sexual landscape. Basically, outside of Christ, today, anything goes. Anything goes. That's where we now live. And how do we as churches respond to that? And the church hasn't been too good at that. Because the church, I think, kind of successfully falls one side or other off the donkey. We either go into the realm of judgmentalism, so we're shaking the fingers and we're tut tut tutting and say, you shouldn't be doing that. Or we go on the other side, which is into the realm of tolerance. Well, we just turn a blind eye. We won't say or do anything. If ever there is a time for the church to find its voice, it's today. In terms of sex and in terms of many other things that we'll be looking at. I believe there's a prophetic nature to what God's calling us to this. So, with your minefield, what do you do? You need to find your clear way through. You need to find where is the clear ground? Where can we put our feet? And very simply, I want to describe the clear ground, and then we're going to look, then we're going to open the Bible, which would be a relief, wouldn't it? Okay? So, what's the clear ground? It simply is this. Paul and Jesus... Both give us the bearings of the original Genesis account of creation. It's in Genesis 1, verse 27 and 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he creates them, male and female. He creates them, both male and female, made in the image of God. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. God created male and female, equal but different, both reflecting the image of God. And he gave them one to one another in an exclusive relationship, which later became known as marriage. And in that relationship, 
And that's, they became one flesh. That's why a man leaves his father and mother in, is united. <laughs> in my notes, I put untied. <laughs> okay, there's a rewrite for you. Okay, uh, that is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That was good. So a biblical view of sex, and this is a really solid, clear ground, is this. It's to be expressed within the covenant of marriage. It's given with the intention of pleasure and within a design for procreation. And if you're in any doubt about that, you can read elsewhere in Scripture. You can read the Song of Songs, which is... You know, it just speaks about the celebration of that. But, 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 it all got messed up. It all got broken. And that's what happened in the fall. And it's a fascinating thing that when the fall, after they have eaten, you know, and, 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 and have doubted God's goodness, actually, that's what they're doing. They're doubting. They're not believing God really is good. As they eat that fruit, their eyes are open. And what's the first thing that happens? It affects their awareness of sexuality. They realize that they're naked. Something gets changed in the whole landscape of sex and sexuality. Which goes back to then. But the good news is this. Jesus came to give life and to give life more abundantly. And we see Jesus doing that. We see him doing it in person. There's that powerful moment when literally the Pharisees are trying to, and the teachers of the law are trying to trip him up. They're trying to kind of whatever. And a woman is caught in adultery, in the very act of adultery, and they kind of put her out in front of him. And Jesus knows what the law says. Stone. Stone those kept in adultery. And Jesus, so full of compassion, so full of grace, and such a demonstration of grace, he says, you know, I, he says, you know, he, he's, he's without sin. Throw the first stone. And one by one, they all drift away. And then he looks at the woman and says, well, neither do I condemn you. Wonderful freedom. Forgiven. But then he says, but go and sin no more. And that's the grace of God, you see. God meets with us in our mess. But true grace then changes us. Can you turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4. No? Yep. Yes, no. Ephesians chapter 5. Just going to read a few verses from here. And what I'm going to try and do is land our understanding of sex into some big, big kind of, I'm going to land some big rocks on it, as it were, in our thinking that is applicable wherever and however, you know, whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we've been married, whatever, I'm going to kind of land some big, big, big theological rocks that help, hopefully will be helpful to every one of us this morning. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. We are children of light. There can be no greater difference between what we were and what we now are in Christ. What we were was darkened in our understanding. Now we're light. We belong in his kingdom of light. We are now children of light. And the whole calling and the whole emphasis that Paul here is he's urging us to live as children of light. In other words, to live a way that is different and distinct to the world we live in. That's, that's the whole message of this. If we were to read on uh, in, in, into the rest of the chapter, he talks about live wisely and to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we really are, that's God's calling for us here. That's our big calling. Whatever stage or age or state of life we're in, that is our calling, is to live as children of light. And it's critical we understand that. And it's summed up in living this life of love, of imitating God. And it is such a critical place for us to start there that Paul says this, live a life of love. That's where we start. That's where, you know, I think before addressing sexual immorality, you've got to get the love of God securely in your sight. Otherwise, we can just end up with judgmentalism. But when we get the love of God clearly in our sight, then also we're not tolerant about sexual immorality. Important difference. Important difference. And what Paul was doing here, so, okay, Paul's encouraging us to live this life of love, and the number one thing he goes for is avoid sexual immorality. Why is that? Well, in Ephesus, it was a key issue. It was where Artemis... Uh, was worshipped. There's a shrine built for Artemis and it's a place of temple prostitution. Immorality was rife in that society. And Paul's addressing one of the issues of the culture of its time. It's not just Paul's kind of anti-sex or stuff like that. No, no, no. Paul, Paul elsewhere you can read about Paul being very for sex in the right context. But what he's addressing is what's going on in the society. And it robs people of true love, walking in the way of love. And if it's true in Ephesus, how much truer is it of us today? Actually, it's been true of every society throughout history. It hasn't really changed, but it has different manifestations of it. So we haven't got a temple to Artemis these days. But what we have got, we have a temple of the internet. And through pornography, we have the greatest exposure to sexual immorality that possibly this world has ever seen. That's reality. That's our day. That's our culture. read these stats that in, in the US, $4 billion a year is spent on video pornography. That's more than that based uh, spent on football, baseball, and basketball. One in four internet users, one in four, look at p- pornography every month. Men, 
Look at pornography more than any other subject. It's not just a male problem. There's growing percentage of women as well. In a book written called Pornland, Gail Dines wrote that an estimated one in four clicks on the internet is porn related. There's 68 million search requests every day. It's huge. It's massive. But then you add into that, not just pornography, you, that horrors of sexual slavery and all the stats behind that. And then you, you just add to that the massive erosion of just foundations to what true, where sexual morality should rest. Godly foundations are being washed away. It's this day we live in. And it was such a day that Paul wrote to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. And he says this, be imitators of God. Walk in love. And that's the first thing I want to really just land. Sorry, I, I, this is application now. <laughs> Way past introduction, it's application. But the first application is this, is to imitate. We are called to imitate God, imitate him. In one sentence, kind of Paul sums up how we're to live, whatever our calling, whatever our state of life is, that actually we are to imitate God as beloved children and walk in the life of love. And how we imitate is by walking in love. You see, what happens with sexual immorality is this. It traps us into lust and self-gratification. If I put that another way, sexual immorality robs us of true love. This is a message that world needs to hear. And the church, we're called to be a community of his love. That means let's be true family. You see, men and women, as being, as being part of the church, men and women need brothers and sisters where there's genuine love. Genuine care, where it's not everything is sexualized. The church is to shine with something different. Paul writes to Timothy, he talks about his relationship with women, and he said, Treat older women with respect as you would your mother. But he says, Treat younger women. As you treat your sister, with absolute purity. You see, women need men they can trust in the church. Whatever age. Men. We need to hold ourselves with purity. Church is family. It's part of walking in love. It's part of, it's not just a concept out there. It looks like this. Let's be true family. Let's build true friendship. Let's be open to one another. That, that's family. That's walking in love. You see, if I know someone loves me, I can be vulnerable with them and I can be open to them. That's walking in love. And that's our hope when we have our struggles with sexual temptation. Because I said right at the beginning, 
we can all struggle with it. There will be folks here. You know, I've had my struggles with sexual temptation. And there's been times I've needed to talk to someone. I've needed to be open. I've needed to be honorable, uh, vulnerable. The Bible talks about if we confess our faults to one another, actually, we can be healed. There's great power in just being open and vulnerable. And if we see the church as a community of love, it allows that. There will be people here. You are struggling with pornography. There are people here who have struggled with pornography, who found real help by doing this very thing, by just being open and confessing it to a trusted friend. As family. This is good. It's kind of serious, isn't it? But it's good. It's vital. How do we live in our days? By building a community of true love. It's vital we understand that. We imitate, we follow, we walk in the way of love. This world is hungry for love. It's longing, and it's looking all the wrong places. And it's calling the wrong things love. And it's why sexual freedom is so available, because somehow that's where the enemy has stolen. It's stolen a good gift, and, it, in, and, and it, it's kind of destroying with it, because it's suggesting if we have sex together, you'll find true love. That's opposite to what the scripture says. And true love isn't just about sex either. And, and another I word, image, that it says here that we, God, God, in, God in his new creation, what he does, he takes us back to the original intention. We are made in the image of God. And he redeems us to that. He frees us to that and actually adds to that. It gets better than that. But actually, that is who we are. We're to be his image bearers. So as a single person, what is our first calling? Well, it's to be an image bearer. Whether I'm male or female, it's to be an image bearer. Well, as a married person, what's my first calling? As a husband or wife, it's to be an image bearer. To represent what God's like. It's about his image. We need to know our, ident our identity. And this whole chapter is surrounded. In fact, it kind of, it's difficult to read that bit I read without reading the whole of Ephesians, and we can't do that. But you need to read the whole of Ephesians where it talks about our identity in Christ. And that's the first thing that is most important about our lives is who we are in Christ. It's been so helped with this book. Um, the plausibility um, uh, Problem and, 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 and it's just written by a guy, Ed Shaw, and you know, he has his own sexual battles to work through. And the first chapter is all about identity, identity, identity. And he said, my first identity about me isn't my sexual identity, it's who I am in Christ. I'm a new creation. We've got to know that. We're his image bearers. We're have, we're in Christ. That's my status. Ed Shaw, I've got a quote. For the thing that defines me most in life is not my sexuality, but my status in Christ. We've got to hear that. It's, becomes, it's a foundation. It's what I'm trying to give. It's these big foundation blocks. There's all sorts of other talks you could spin off from here. <laughs> okay? But let's get these foundations in. Identity. We're image bearers. We're to imitate, and in intimacy. God calls us to intimacy. There's something in every one of us that longs for intimacy. And someone described intimacy in this way. 
it, 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 it's, be, it's knowing and being known. It's really being known. And that's where sexual intimacy, uh, the intimacy isn't just about sex. Now, I think we can see biblically that within the, the gift of sex within marriage, intimacy should very much be part of that. But intimacy is bigger than that. And the world, actually, has hijacked that word, intimacy. Uh, again, a quote from uh, another excellent, excellent book about, um, from a guy called Sam Albury. He says this, our culture, that, he says, that our culture imagines that intimacy only occurs in the context of sexual attraction goes to show how little our culture understands and really experiences, wait for it, true friendship. You see, there's an intimacy that is found in friendship. So you can have some married people who are very lonely. You can have some single people who know a real intimacy and friendship. Got to hear this. And here, Paul, uh, when Paul was talking about, you know, live this life of love as dearly loved children, the ESV is so much better. It says, as beloved children, we're beloved. That's the most intimate thing about us. God loves us. It's, you know, we, we didn't set the worship up this morning. <laughs> okay. It's all about the love of God. It's wonderful. Just hear about the love of God. We are in the beloved. Remember, hear this. It's not just God is benevolent towards us. It's not just he, he feels good about us. It's, not, it's much bigger than that. We're beloved. We're actually in the Son. He loves us as he loves his own Son. We're in the beloved. The word over every one of us is beloved. With that word comes incredible, deep awareness. God is intimate with us. We can know him. He knows us. When this planet is all done and dusted, when it's all wrapped up and new heaven and new earth is fully here, What's it all going to be about? It's going to be about one marriage. The marriage with Jesus. It'll be a great consummation. And it, again, there'll be that, that, that's what we're all en route for. To be overwhelmed with his love. And now we can know him in us. And we can know access to his love. Intimacy. And then just the, the, the final I, okay, is inheritance. It's, it's fascinating. A number of times Paul picks up sexual immorality and inheritance, whatever. And one of the things that he's a plead, pleading for, I think, in this is let's know where we're going. Let's live in the light of eternity now. You see, the world is so short-sighted and it so grabs at things. It's one of the things that drives sexual immorality. Actually, it's a consumerism. It's saying, I want it, I want it now. I want it now, I want it now. It's short-sighted. But God gives us his inheritance. We do have a future. And that's where together we're all caught up in that. Inheritance, what are we living to? That we are his bride. We're betrothed to him. And, it, and in Christ, we've got a remarkable inheritance. The consummation is yet to come. We do need to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be the greatest wedding this planet could ever conceive of. It certainly has been the most expensive. True. 
And actually, it's where it's all going. And we've got to get, let God do a big thing in our hearts about this. If we don't get the big things about inheritance in place, we can make all sorts of wrong decisions on the way. There's a tragic story we, we, we kind of read about in Genesis of Esau, Jacob, do you remember that? And you remember Esau, he sold his birthright for a meal. And I always remember Terry Virgo, who, you know, as many of you know, kind of is the father of our, our family of churches. He, 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 he kind of, I haven't got a coin, but he, he, he kind of said, it's amazing. If you put a coin, you know, you could put, you could put a 10p over your eye and you can block out the sun. Esau, for a moment of hunger, sold his birthright for a meal. <coughs> Meanwhile, Moses made the decision to suffer disgrace in Egypt's fair, or, 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 or to resist the temptation of Egypt's palace and everything for the treasures that were set before him. We've got to settle inheritance. What are we living for? Are we just living for today's appetite fix? Or do we live for something bigger? All these words are big words. Identity. We're made in his image. Inheritance. Let's imitate him. Let's know that there's an intimacy that isn't just locked into sex. The world is lying to us on that one. If you are married, cultivate that, enjoy it, celebrate it. But if you're not, don't feel you can't know intimacy. You can know true intimacy of friendship. And there's an intimacy we all need to know in Christ, which if we don't get that, then actually, whether married or not, we just live by appetite. We've got to see, we've got to see this big calling. It, it, it's, it's a shape us. Please hear this. It's a help us individually, but it's that we can be a different sort of people in today's world. How people are hungry for this. If you've messed up, and we all have different times, if you messed up, I want you to know this loud and clear, we can be forgiven. Jesus did not condemn the woman, neither does he condemn you. But you can live differently. It can change. If you need help on any of these things, there's so many things I just touched on, touched on, touched on. If you need help, then please ask for help. There's going to be no appeal this morning. There's no time of ministry this morning. Okay? But if you want help, ask for it. We're family. We're friends together on a mission. The stakes are too high. Let's ask for it. If you find asking someone too difficult, we've actually got an envelope over there by the welcome table. And you can just take an envelope, and in it, you can just, there's a piece of paper, and you can just write down your struggle. It could be anything. And you haven't got to sign it, it's anonymous. You can just sign it. It's a first step. See it in that way. It's a first step. But if you find it too difficult to speak to someone, just write in that envelope and, and just pop it in at the hub. Put it through a letterbox. And what we will do, we'll pray. That's it. But having done the first step, it might be easier to take a second step or thinking, I'd like to talk to someone. If you've got questions... There are so many things. I, my struggle this morning, and I know I've taken longer than what I normally do, 
But my struggle this morning has been what not to say and how to say it. If you've got questions, then write them in, email me, text me, or any of the other leaders. Just be in touch with us, and we'll think out how best to help you. This isn't just a tick, we've done this one. I think we're speaking to something that is so profound and so important for all of us, whatever age and whatever stage. God causes us to shine, to walk as children of thy, to imitate him, to follow him, to walk in the way of love. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask Maz to come up. She's been hosting this morning, and I think it would be good. I, I, I just want Maz to pray. I'll get there. And then I'll pray. And actually, I think we're going to finish with that song. Is that right? Do you want to get the band up? Just okay. Thanks. But let's just let's just engage as Maz leads us in prayer. Lord, we have heard your truth this morning, and we thank you for the foundation that has in our lives. Lord, there are many struggles here as we deal with with the issue of sex. Lord, there are many challenges. And Lord, we live in a world which is confused. But Lord, we thank you that you have given us an inheritance in your son. Mm. We thank you for that that is eternal. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have an eternal perspective on our lives. Lord, that we could remember who we are in you, that we are children of the living God who wants only the best for us. Lord, help us to be your image bearers. Lord, to be your light in the places where we go, in the challenges that we face and the questions that are posed to us, in our own personal battles and struggles. Lord, we know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Lord, and we declare that and we say thank you for that. But Lord, help us. Help us. Amen.